Well, welcome to our study of the Gospel of Mark once again. My name is John Robbins. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. I'm always grateful that you would choose to be a part of Bible study. That means a great deal to me, and I certainly hope and pray every week that this is meaningful and beneficial to you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Let's talk briefly about what we dealt with last week, and then we're going to move into a fascinating story. Uh, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on that story tonight where we begin telling you a personal story about an experience I had that uh, relates to this particular text. We saw Jesus last week deal with a Syrophoenician woman, a Greek-speaking Gentile. It appears at face value that Jesus has been extremely rude to her. It's almost upsetting to read it. But as we talked about last week, when we exegete the text, when we dig down beneath the surface, we discover that it's Jesus' way of really testing this woman to make a determination about whether or not she really does have the faith for her daughter to be made well. And she does. Jesus puts obstacles in her way. She overcomes all of those obstacles. And when she arrives home, her daughter is made well. It is the one time in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus heals somebody who is not physically in his presence. He then takes a deaf man whose speech is very poor, carries him off by themselves, and Jesus uses everything at his disposal to bring about healing for this man. Come back into the presence of the crowd of people, and of course, they are astounded at what's happened. Jesus tries to get them to keep it to themselves, but they're unable to do so, and then more and more people are gonna follow Jesus as a result. It tells us once again that people just keep pressing in on Jesus. There are people around Jesus who lack faith. There are people around Jesus who constantly want something for him, and we're gonna see in just a moment that that has taken a toll on Jesus' capacity to do what he needs to do. He then feeds 4,000 people, and there are 12 baskets full left over. The feeding of the 4,000 is only found in Matthew and Mark. Those 12, excuse me, those seven baskets that are left over in the feeding of the 4,000 represent a complete number, the number seven. Three, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, four, north, south, east, and west, or the four corners of the earth, if you will, Three plus four equals seven. There are seven days in a complete week. It is a number that represents completeness. There are then those who wanted a sign from Jesus. Prove to us, jump through a hoop, stand on your head. Let us know somehow you are who you claim to be. And Jesus said, I'm not doing any of that. I'm gonna do what I'm supposed to do. Jesus gets into a boat with the disciples and Jesus warns them about the yeast of the Pharisees. Though Mark doesn't tell us what it is, we gather that it is uh, evidence of the blindness of the Pharisees and many others for that matter who simply don't know who Jesus is and that they have to watch out for the teachings of the Pharisees. So now we're gonna pick up with chapter eight beginning with verse 22. So let's read through this little pericope, we call it, a portion of scripture. Pericope, another one of those words that we discover in Seminary, P-E-R-I-C-O-P-E, -E, pericope, a small portion of scripture. I'll read through it. We'll go back and talk about it. Remember, to preface what I'm about to read, Jesus is surrounded by unbelief. He is physically worn out. Crowds continue to press on him. He tries to get away to no avail. There are many occasions we've already seen in Mark's gospel where he doesn't even have a chance to eat. Verse 22, chapter 8. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go into the village. This is an extraordinary story. I wonder sometimes if I were the writer of the Gospel of Mark, would I have included this story? Because, to be honest, it makes Jesus look weak, incapable of doing the very thing he was called to do. Here's the story. They bring to Jesus a man who was blind and ask Jesus to touch him, to make him well so that he can see. And Jesus touches him. And the man 
cannot see clearly. It doesn't work. Jesus is incapable in this moment of bringing healing to this man completely, so he has to do it again. There's a retake, a second go at it. Now, the second time Jesus is able to heal this man. But remember, this man says to Jesus, because Jesus asked him the question, can you see? Even Jesus knows that maybe I didn't get this one just right. And the man says, well, I see people, but they look like trees. I want to tell you a quick story. When I was in high school, I worked for a construction company. One summer, working for that company, we tore down an old barn. We took the old wood and the barbed wire and other wire, and we loaded up pickups and trailers all day long, went out into the country where there was a huge hole, and we were told by our boss to empty those trailers and those pickups full of debris and put it in that hole, and eventually a bulldozer would come and cover it all up. As we were working out there, I grabbed a big chunk of wire and was pulling on that, trying to get it out of the back of the truck and into that hole, and as I pulled back on it, the wire snapped and I hit myself in the eye. I didn't wear glasses at the time. That's why I wear glasses now. I hit myself in my open eye with my fist. Uh, it was evident that something happened pretty seriously right away. I began to feel fluid run down my cheek and the other person that I was working with said, John, are you okay? And I said, I think I have a black eye. He said, open up your eye. I said, I can't. He reached down, opened up my eye and said, my gosh, get in the truck. Get in the truck right now. I noticed that there wasn't much there. It looked as though I had lost my eye. To make a long story short, I ended up having emergency surgery on my eye in the next few hours. I was rushed to the hospital in Dallas where they performed surgery. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I had to lie flat on my back. I couldn't raise up my head because they were worried that the pressure of sitting up would tear open the surgically repaired eye. So I had to lie flat on my back with both eyes covered so I wouldn't move my eyes around. I did that for two weeks. When the patches were taken off, I was completely blind in my right eye. I was told that I would maybe be able to see out of that eye and maybe not, but that I ought to be grateful that I still had my eye after all. And I was grateful. It quickly altered my life, as you can imagine. I was playing football. I could no longer play football or sports for a good period of time. I couldn't drive a car because my depth perception was off in trying to drive with just one eye. And I had to put this ointment in my eye, this Vaseline-like substance, every day in my eye and wear an eye patch. My mother put the Vaseline substance in my eye and I wore an eye patch for an extended period of time. And I was told not to remove the patch and try to look through the eye that was blind. But I didn't pay much attention. I remember the very day I was watching television and I uncovered my eye and tried to see through the injured eye and could see flickers of light on the television. I started to get so excited. And this is what is interesting to me about this story that we read in the Gospel of Mark is that over time, I started to be able to see a little more clearly. But when I looked at people, guess what they looked like? Trees. Just as this young man says to Jesus. When Jesus asked him, can you see? Well, I can see, but people kind of look like trees. Because there was a trunk, and there, there were appendages, if you will, sticking out. And I read this story, and every time I read it, I think to myself, that is so close to what I experienced when I was in high school. Now, fortunately for me, I have been able to recover a great deal of my sight in my injured eye. I have to wear glasses, and eventually it would create a cataract as a result of the injury that I had to have removed. But I still have my own eye, and I can see through that eye, and I'm incredibly grateful to God for that. But every time I read this story that we find in the Gospel of Mark, and only in Mark's Gospel, I am reminded that that man saw people as trees, and that's what I experienced. 
Now, why would Mark include this story? It makes Jesus look weak. Because notice what Mark has done. He has built for us an image of the kind of people that Jesus surrounds himself with trying to do ministry. Those around Jesus in his own hometown reject him, and he can't perform miracles there because of their lack of faith. Jesus is around these disciples who time and time again, for whatever reason, just don't seem to get it because they lack faith. Now Jesus tries to heal a man. He is worn out physically. He has had crowds pressing in on him. He has been surrounded by unbelief. And for whatever reason, Mark chooses to include this story of Jesus kind of, sort of, just a little bit healing a guy, but having to do it again. Now, ultimately, Jesus is successful in healing this man who was blind, but initially, it doesn't work. It's one of the ways in which we, again, see Mark remind us of the toll Jesus' ministry is taking on him with regard to the people that are around him. But Jesus keeps plugging away and keeps moving on. Now notice in verse 26, he then sent him away to his home saying, do not even go into the village. What Jesus is trying to do is avoid publicity on the part, on his part, so that they don't try to make him king. There are those who want Jesus to be somebody other than who he is. So Jesus says to people, don't tell anybody, or Jesus says, just go to your home and don't mix with the crowd, whatever it may be. It's an interesting story, and I appreciate the fact that Mark includes it because it gives us even more insight into who Jesus is. But if I were putting the Gospel of Mark together, or if I were putting the Gospels together, there are those stories in there I just wouldn't include because it makes Jesus look weak. There are times when Jesus gets mad. There are times when he gets frustrated. There are times when he is so tired and worn out. There are times when he cries. There are times when he can't pull off the miracle completely. There are times when he asks a crowd to do something and they do the very thing he doesn't want them to do. It makes Jesus look real. It makes him look human. Though he is fully God, he is also fully human, having to deal with the foibles of those who are around him, the consequences of all of that. So I appreciate the fact that the gospel writers include these different kinds of stories of Jesus. It makes him all the more real, all the more accessible, I believe. All right, verse 7, chapter 8. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Now this is just a little thing I want you to make uh, you I want to make you aware of a little pet peeve I have. Oftentimes people will say Caesarea Philippi. It is Caesarea Philippi. It is named after Caesar. So we wouldn't say Julius Caesar. We would say Julius Caesar. So the proper pronunciation actually is Caesarea Philippi, a city named in honor of Caesar Augustus. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Peter is the first one in the Gospel of Mark to declare Jesus as the Messiah. We are well into the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark before anyone publicly declares Jesus to be the Messiah. Jesus asked the disciples, hey, what are people saying about me? Well, there are some people who are saying you're John the Baptist. There are others saying that you're Elijah and others saying you're one of the other prophets. And then Jesus emphatically asked the question, but who do you say that I am? And he has every right to ask that of the disciples who don't seem to have any idea who he is. But on this occasion, they nail it, they get it just right, because Peter says, you are the Messiah. <clears throat> That's how it is with the disciples, lacking faith in extraordinary ways, having faith in extraordinary ways, lacking and having over and over again. In verse 31, 
Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed after three days he will rise again. This is the first time in Mark's gospel that we see Jesus declare his coming suffering, that he's going to be rejected, and that he's going to be killed, and that he's going to rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is going to be ordained by God, says Jesus. Peter, don't interfere with what God's plan is. These things have to take place. I want you to read after Bible study tonight to go to Isaiah chapter 52. Start reading at verse 13 and read through chapter 53, verse 12. It is Isaiah talking about the suffering servant, Jesus himself, that these things are going to take place. And Peter says, Jesus, I'm not going to let this happen. Peter often does that. I'll take a bullet for you, Jesus, if I have to, but I'm not going to let that happen. And P Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, can you imagine being called Satan by Jesus himself? But what Jesus is saying is, Peter, don't stand in the way of God's plan. That's what Satan would do. You don't do that. Don't stand in the way of what God has set out to do. You're putting your mind on human things. you got to have your mind focus on the divine. Verse 34, he called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now notice this. I want you to see something that I think is very important that we find in the Gospel of Mark, that we find in Matthew and Luke as well. And is the notion that to be a follower of Jesus Christ means that there is a level of suffering that accompanies that. These people that espouse to believe that everything is handed to us if we follow Jesus Christ, this sense of entitlement that God owes me, if I have enough faith and I believe strongly enough that God's going to take care of me, there's going to be a parking spot for me at the mall just as I want it, when I want it, because that's what God owes me because I'm faithful. Uh, God somehow should make me prosperous because I'm a believer, all those kinds of things. That is bunk when it comes to the Christian faith. On the contrary, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. Another way of saying it is you've got to be last in order for uh, others to become first so that one day you can become first because you were last. Jesus says if you want to be exalted, you've got to be humble. If you want to win your life, you got to lose it. You have to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. Being a follower of Jesus Christ requires of us that we surrender ourselves for the sake of the gospel message and everything that goes along with that. If anyone owes anything to anyone, we owe everything to God. But so much that is preached today is preached that is heretical. The notion that somehow, if I have enough faith, I don't have to worry about getting cancer. I don't have to worry about my children getting sick. I don't have to worry about being unemployed. I don't have to worry about all these things. I wonder now what those people are preaching in the midst of a pandemic, where they preach over and over again, God owes me. Now what do you do with that? Sometimes being a follower of Jesus Christ means that we have to surrender ourselves for the greater good and suffering can be a part of that process. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Jesus says, what good is it to have everything if the thing you ultimately have to have, you don't have? You can have everything and still have nothing. What good is it to gain everything and still have nothing? Remember what Solomon says, after Solomon has accumulated all of these possessions and all of these concubines, he is the wisest man on planet Earth. He is the man who has everything at his disposal. He is the richest man. He has taken everything and multiplied it time and time again. He has not gone without any desire. And at the end of his life, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this regarding all that he's accumulated. Meaningless. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What Solomon means is, I haven't found ultimate happiness in any of this. 
What Jesus tells us is what good is it to collect one thing after another, accumulate one thing after another, and to forfeit your soul in the process. It's not about accumulating. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship that is life-changing, that requires our complete self, surrendering ourselves. If we want to save our life, we have to lose it. We have to give it away for the sake of Jesus Christ. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into his glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now this is one of those statements that we find that is rather disconcerting, to say the least. Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. Now what Jesus means by that is, that our relationship is a bilateral covenant. There are unilateral covenants in the Bible and there are bilateral covenants. A unilateral covenant is where God says, I'm just going to do this for you. Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. I just choose to do that. It's one way. A bilateral covenant is when God says, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Jesus says that we have to surrender ourselves to him. If you're ashamed of me and you don't care about me, then you have no place with me. That makes sense. And so what Jesus reminds us of is that we are never to be ashamed, as Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. So we are not ashamed of who we are or what we believe. Chapter 9. Let's see how far we get tonight. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Now, when the kingdom of God is fully realized, that's the question. What does Jesus mean by that? He means that it is fully realized in a relationship with him. And there are some in this life, in Jesus' day and time, who will experience the kingdom in its fullness in relationship with Jesus Christ more than anything else. All right, now we come to an interesting story that we find in Matthew, Luke, and in, interestingly enough, 2 Peter. So it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 2 Peter. It's not found in the Gospel of John, but it is the story of the transfiguration of Jesus. It says six days later. Well, why would Mark tell us six days later? What difference does it make? Remember, six was significant because Jesus is about to go up on a mountain with the disciples. In the book of Exodus, in the 24th chapter, verses 15 and 16, there's a cloud that settles over Mount Sinai, but just before God speaks with Moses. So now, in the New Testament, six days, right before God speaks again on a mountain, this happens. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, those are the big three of the disciples, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. So it shows the purity of who Jesus is. Jesus goes up onto a mountain with Peter, James, and John, and while they're up on the mountain, suddenly Jesus literally changes in front of them. He is as glowing as anyone can be. He is pure, undefiled in every way. He is dazzling white in their presence. It represents purity to the nth degree. And there, now think about it if you're Peter, James, or John. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Now, Elijah represents the prophets, and Moses is going to represent the law. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. A dwelling would be like, we would say today, a historical marker. Let's, let's define this place that something extraordinary happened here. Let's make three of them, Jesus, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you. 
We sing, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. Now, what does it mean to raise my Ebenezer? Ebenezer was like a rock. It was a, a place where something was defined, where you marked a spot where something holy had taken place. To raise an Ebenezer is to define that place as something special. So Peter says, Jesus, let's define this. I mean, we have Elijah here, and we have Moses here, and we have you here. It says in verse 6, He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now think about it for a moment. What God does, Jesus has been transfigured. Elijah and Moses, who represent the prophets and the law, are visible there. Peter says, let's make a dwelling place for all three of them. Let's mark this. And God says, no, 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 no. You listen to Jesus. This is my son. It's the same thing that God said when Jesus was baptized. This is my son, the beloved. And in the Mount of Transfiguration, God adds, listen to him. Jesus supersedes all of the prophets and all of the law. And the great lawgiver himself, Moses. Jesus is far superior to them. He ranks above all others. And what God does is clearly define in the moment on the Mount of Transfiguration that it is Jesus whose message supersedes any other message, whose personality supersedes any other personality. You listen to him. You don't make three dwelling places. Jesus is far superior to those others. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. Now, here's what I want you to see. I think this is really interesting. We've seen that Jesus has said to people he's healed and to others, don't tell anybody about what's happened. Jesus now tells Peter, James, and John as they're coming back down from the mountain, after they have seen Jesus transfigured, after they've seen Elijah, after they've seen Moses, after they've heard the voice of God, Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this till I'm risen from the dead. So if you flip over to 2 Peter, toward the end of the New Testament, if you'll flip over there, I want you to see something very quickly. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll give you just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 16. This is well after Jesus has been resurrected, well after Jesus has ascended. This is what Peter writes to the early church. Listen to this. Verse 16, chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, this is, my, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with them on the holy mountain. So the disciples wait. They don't tell anybody. And after Jesus has been resurrected and ascended to the Father, and many years later, Peter says, I was an eyewitness. We're not following a myth. Peter says, I'm telling you, I was an eyewitness to all of this. On the mountain, we heard the voice of God define who Jesus is. It's a really special way in which Jesus in Mark's gospel is defined, as is the case in Matthew and Luke's gospel as well. They are not to announce his Messiahship until after Jesus is no longer physically in their presence. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. They still don't get it, even though Jesus said, I'm going to suffer and die, etc. Then they asked him, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. Now then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, and is written about him. So they asked the question, uh, why is it that some say that Elijah has to come before all of this can take place? 
If you read the prophet Malachi, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, if you'll go to the fourth chapter of the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, it says this in chapter 4, verse 5. Malachi says, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. There's a 400-year span between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But what Malachi says is this, that there is going to be one who comes who's going to set the stage. He's going to be the Elijah, if you will, who sets the say, stage for the great day that is to come, that is, in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is going to say that Elijah has come because we know the one who set the stage for the coming of Christ. It is John the Baptist. So Jesus is making reference here to John the Baptist when he makes a point about Elijah already having come. So we are going to stop right here and we are going to continue on in just a moment or next week I should say with an interesting story found in the 14th verse of the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. I hope this is helpful for you. It's a lot to cover in a short period of time, but hopefully in some way it helps you in your walk with Jesus Christ. I greatly appreciate you being a part of this study. It means a great deal to me. I hope it means a great deal to you. I'm privileged to be able to gather with you around the table, if you will, each week, open up God's word and look at it and struggle with it and find ourselves in the midst of all this and to know repeatedly there, there is one who never gave up on us. He never gave up on the disciples. He will never give up on us. And he loves us thoroughly through and through. And we get to see what his ministry is like. We get to see what his life is like. We get to see how he interacts with other people and all that goes along with that. So we continue next week with our study of the Gospel of Mark. Thank you for being a part of it this evening.